Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself, Mark Vernon, and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi Rupert. Hello Mark. So this is uh, conversations where we just come together and we've just literally said let's talk about what we're going to talk about and the idea is that we see where this leads us and in the hope that by listening to the flow of our exchange it prompts thoughts and um, maybe even conversations yourself. So please, I hope you enjoy um, the conversation and do share it with others and um, see whether it takes you to places you hadn't expected as we might now go to. Um, but as a starting point, Rupert, mm. I thought um, we might talk about um, the environment, um, which clearly is uh, you know, becoming more and more and more important with uh, climate change and uh, um, the collapse of um, the natural world. But through the lens of Celtic Christianity, to give it a bit of a take. And the reason why I wondered about this is because I've just read a, a book which I thought was just fantastic uh, called The Naked Hermit. Um, by a chap called Nick Mayhew Smith. Um, he uh, lives in London um, and wrote a really uh, lovely book, actually, called Britain's Holiest Places, oh, which yes. is a kind of yeah, a kind of I collection like of wells much. and shrines. And I, we mm-hmm. kept it in our car for a while, and you're never more than 10 miles from some secret spring that you didn't even know existed, you know. So it's a wonderful book. Mm, I, I've been to several of the ones he suggests there, and they're fantastic. It's a really, really good book. Yeah, and he tells you a little bit about it. tells you how to get there, mm. um, which sometimes uh, ones that are off the beaten track is a bit um, tricky. You wouldn't know otherwise. Um, but around every corner, it felt there was some part of these sacred aisles you know, to be discovered. Mm. Anyway, so this book did well, um, and he's now written this book, um, The Naked Hermit. And what he wanted to do was press the actual practices that particularly the early Christians in the British Isles might have engaged in. So these are the things which you very quickly read about if you get into Anglo-Saxon Christianity um, and the paganism that perhaps preceded it. Um, Things like praying whilst immersed in rivers, things like uh, talking to the birds or animals, and things like climbing holy mountains. Um, And he did both a kind of bit of scholarly research trying to work out exactly what was going on from the texts that survive from these periods. So this is, these are things like texts like about people like St Cuthbert or St Ninian um, or the Anglo-Saxon um, uh, uh, saints like um, uh, Ethelred and um, uh, other ones, that are less, a bit less well-known like Godric and various other figures. The texts which sort of survive uh, from, from this period. Um, and... Um, but also undergo the practices himself. And this is what I really felt gave the book such a good take, because um, it's it's coming, putting the two together, his own participation um, in these practices, that actually has given him not only fresh, but I think really quite a radical thesis about Celtic Christianity, but also why it matters today. So this is kind of what I thought would be uh, worth exploring a little bit. Well, it sounds really fascinating. Uh, I love the fact he's doing them himself because um, otherwise it's just archaeological or histori- historical research, isn't it? Um, and actually, some of this, like praying in cold water, you know, which is said of St. Cuthbert at Lindisfarne, you know, one might think this is some weird practice they did there. But the fact is, nothing could be more fashionable. Um, you know, Wim Hof and his immersion in cold water thing is tremendously um, fashionable. I'm always meeting people who are doing the Wim Hof method of being in cold water for a kind of enlightened state of mind. And indeed, Merlin, my own son, has taken it up and, you know, he can't get water cold enough. You know, he swims on Hampstead Heath in, in, in the middle of the winter. His cold showers aren't cold enough. He has ice baths. I mean, this is uh, uh, something that's actually happening now and clearly it must have uh, some kind of spiritual dimension, otherwise why would people be doing it? Well, um, it's very interesting you mention the, you know, pick up on that one particularly, because um, he comes to a completely different conclusion about why people like Cuthbert got into the sea and got into the river and praised God, um, because a sort of standard take on it is that it's about the mortification of the flesh, mm. as it were, there was a deep strand of antibody spirituality um, in the ancient world and um, that these saints were sort of flagellating themselves in some sort of ascetic extreme 
uh, to try and get rid of that. But he said the minute he did it himself, he realised that this is this immersion is a literal immersion, but it's also to immerse spiritually in nature and to feel a, a radical kind of oneness with with nature, particularly perhaps with water. Um, and he does it naked. I mean, that's partly why the book's called The Naked Hermit. He's very keen that um, on you know doing things. Uh, uh, sort of literally in the best possible sense, if you at, at all can. And um, there's quite amusing comments in the book as well about how he sort of made sure no one was watching and he wasn't going to upset mm. anyone and so on. But nonetheless, um, he, he discovers that not only is it about being immersed in nature and feeling a kind of connection with nature, which he just wouldn't have realised otherwise, um, but he also has this sense that nature itself um, is reaching out to the divine, is praising God. This is the kind of mystical side of it, I guess. Um, and so the stories, for example, of Cuthbert, first of all, immersing himself in the sea, then coming out of the sea and the otters appearing and washing and, and drying his feet. Mm. Suddenly this makes complete sense that this is all of nature kind of coming together um, rather than a kind of ascetic Cuthbert flagellating himself and then finding some consolation from the otters. Mm. Um, and it leads to a very different kind of theology because he also then argues that what the Celtic uh, Christianity might have for us um, is a sense of a restored connection with nature and a sort of lost even Eden that kind of returns. He talks very movingly about how he's come to realise that paradise in a way is just a touch away if only we knew how to reach out and connect with it. Um, so, you know, th these participative practices, they take him an, an awful long way, actually. And it feels it feels invigorating reading about it, let alone kind of doing it. I see. Well, that, how does he connect it with the Celtic tradition then? Because, I mean, the Druids, who were the precursors to Christianity, I mean, the, 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 the early Celtic Christians in Ireland and in Britain... Um, were people who became Christians against a Druid background. In fact, the early ones, I suppose, were Druids. And um, I don't know very much about the Druidic religion. I mean, insofar as Druidism survives in Wales in the Eisteddfod, um, the two can combine. And Rowan Williams, after all, was Archbishop of Canterbury after being Archbishop of Wales and also a Druid. There's nothing the anti Rowan Williams tabloid newspapers like better than printing pictures of him in white robes at the Eisteddfod as a Druid. Um, so how does he link in with the Druid tradition? Well, it, uh, the first thought is that actually Philip Corgom, the arch-Druid, um, is one of his kind of collaborators on the book. He sort of thanks him in, in the acknowledgements. So he's very aware of that tradition as it lives today. And I think particularly because someone like Philip remembers all the stories and traditions associated with very particular places. So he himself is a kind of um, encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, but broadly what he argues is, and again, this perhaps is, um, I don't know if it's controversial in Celtic Christianity studies or not, but it felt um, different, is that he argues that when the Christians first came to these islands, um, they tried to convert people using practices that had worked in Europe. So there, it seems like there were a couple of, of key practices. One was um, to tell people that their lives were kind of unethical, like their marriage practices weren't right, and and, and that they were you know at risk, as it were, um, from leading unethical lives. But that didn't seem to touch people here. Um, the other thing they tried to do, the, the other thing they tried to do was um, uh, erase old practices. Um, so there's quite a lot of stories uh, in European uh, Christianity around this time, people like Boniface cutting down sacred trees. Mm. Um, and again, that didn't really seem to do the trick um, no. on these islands. Um, and then, so what he thinks they actually realised was that um, they needed to show how Christianity was a kind of paganism upgrade, almost, to put it controversially, or it was like Druidism plus. And, and and what they did, the saints like Cuthbert, well, the earlier ones, I guess, uh, like Ninian, perhaps, and what they did was um, they were seen to go to places that um, the indigenous people were afraid of. You know, so they went as hermits into caves where it was said spirits lurked, um, or they went um, into the waters that were moved by forces that frightened people. And they showed them that there was actually a perception of creation um, that came from the one creator um, that um, who, who was filled in all these places um, and could befriend all these places 
um, could, as it were, partly quite usefully, um, you know, make these places not to be afraid of anymore. Um, but sort of more um, theologically, you might say, they kind of redeemed these places for um, the indigenous pagans. And so he very much tells a story about how Celtic Christianity was a kind of, in a way, the next stage um, that built on rather than, you know, try to ride roughshod over um, the religiosity that was round and about. And, and, and apart from the texts that he tries to understand in his own practices, he, he asks questions, you know, like, why are there so many sacred trees still in Anglo-Saxon churchyards? Um, you know, the... Um, um, the, the elders and so on that, that still exist. The use. Uh, the use, pardon, sorry, the use that still exist, thanks. Um, and um, he says, you know, th- this is evidence that these were kind of taken up into um, rather than uh, try to be obliterated. Um, and uh, so present, but presents this really fascinating uh, picture, I think, of a, a kind of Christianity that tried to work with the indigenous spirit of the place um, and show people how they could, in a way, could connect with it even more through um, the monotheistic idea, broadly, that there was a single creator um, that kind of embraced uh, the natural world, rather than, you know, the many spirits and different gods of different places who may be good, may be ill. Um, he, he argues that, you know, this was kind of hard work. This was hard won. Um, he, 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 as well as immersing himself in rivers, he goes and spends nights in sacred caves and realises that it's, you know, it's a tricky life. Um, but when you... When you think of it in terms of trying to redeem the place, trying to really connect with the place to befriend the Swifts that are living in there too and so on, as he talks about at one point, and um, we're going on to an island. He goes on to the island um, in uh, Derwent Water. I forget the saint now who associated with it, um, but he has a tremendous sort of experience there. Um, where he, as it were, he feels that he's connecting with um, the spirit of the place that's far deeper than just Christianity. You know, it's coming out of a timelessness. Mm. And so argues that, you know, this is what Christianity must have been like to really have um, Im- embedded itself in people's lives. Well, that's really fascinating. It sounds very attractive. And the idea of going beyond what was there before, building on it, uh, it totally appeals to me. I mean, that's. In a way, you could see parallels in the Hindu tradition, where the you know the successive waves of development in India have built on what's there before and actually include it and don't try and destroy it. They they include it, incorporate it. Yeah, yeah. So Buddhism is a kind of development of Hinduism, uh, yes. as well as something that that went off on in its on its in its own sort of right. Well, and uh, there's lots of stories in Tibet about the when the first Buddhists arrived there, then the people who were the, the Bon who were there before. Um, you know, they had all these sacred caves and sacred places and sacred mountains. And the Tibetan Buddhists didn't try and get rid of all that. They sort of included them. They, they, they went further. It became kind of Bon plus. That's why Tibetan Buddhism is so different from Southern Buddhist traditions, which are much simpler. But Tibetan Buddhism has all these gods and protector deities, and and each place has its protector deities, and they're very closely related to the previous Bon practices and beliefs. And indeed, there still are Bons in Tibet. Yeah, I mean, he argues that there's, there's a sort of practical side to it too, because, for example, it seems like sacred trees um, couldn't be defiled by bringing weapons uh, into their shade. Um, and so, you know, again, when the missionaries were kind of talking to the locals if you like um sacred trees were also safe places to try to engage people um so it's like a happy marriage of the kind of politics as well as the spirituality and um, but very much i think trying to uh, find out connections um with what already exists and and you know so g- going back to what you were saying about rome williams and the druids i mean in a way you know perhaps i don't know how consciously or not but they're tapping into the origins of Christianity in this country, um, not as it were trying to do some new syncretism. Mm. And maybe that's why it, it feels like it's in the flow. It feels like um, it, it, it has deep meaning. It's not just a kind of modern attempt to heal a few, a few wounds. You know, it's really, mm. it creates something far more profound than that, I think. Certainly when I went on a pilgrimage um, with Philip Corgon, um around Lewis um, and uh, you know, he talked not just about the Christian history of the place, but um, we, we climbed the mounds just outside Lewis and he told the stories um, that might be associated with the mound and how they connected with Christian ideas about, you know, there is a, there is a kind of green hill and the crucifix on the top of the green hill and so on. And uh, 
Um, it felt like a, a virtuous spiral up rather than a kind of competition between ideas. Yes. Well, I mean, that's certainly what I'd like to think of and, and how I'd like to approach it myself because I feel that relating to nature is such an important part. Um, but the, then there's the bit that always comes in is, you know, some missionary did cut down trees, holy trees, and did try and suppress what was there before. I mean, I think a lot more incorporation went on than most modern sort of rather Enlightenment-inspired histories suggest. But there was this massive change in Britain through the Synod of Whitby when the Celtic Church, which was mainly in the north of England and spread from Ireland, encountered the Roman Church, which had come in through Canterbury and St. Augustine. And then there was this whole question about... I mean, the, the ostensible point of disagreement was the fixing the date of Easter, but it was much more than that. It was about whether these Celtic traditions should be the dominant ones or whether the more standardised control from Rome should be more standard. Yeah, he's very much trying to trace um, the history before the Council, the Synod of Whitby, I think which was in 664 or something like that, if I remember yes. right, right. And he talks about how um, there was the dating of Easter, um, you know, which is symbolically very important because it is about how you connect with the natural world and the cycles of the moon. And, but he also talks about baptism practices um, and again, that's really significant because it's about what you do with your body. Um, and again, that very much chimes with the, the theme of the book, how you actually physically participate um, in rituals and in the natural world. And so, you know, whether or not you're naked or not uh, comes to matter very, very, very much. Um, and in a way, the sort of bad guy in the book is actually a, a fairly standard bad guy in Christian history, um, which is St. Augustine, not of Canterbury, but of Hippo. Mm. Um, and he argues that uh, Augustine's notion of original sin, mm. um, where, as it were, nature is not something to be redeemed with, um, but nature is a reminder of your wickedness and your fallenness. Mm. Uh, picking up on the text in Genesis, you know, where God says to Adam, you know, you'll have to struggle with the soil, um, the snake will become your enemy. Um, and this led to a parallel tradition, which is very powerful, I think, in Western Christianity, um, about how uh, nature reminds you of uh, your fallenness, your wickedness, and you have an antagonistic relationship with nature. Um, and he argues that indirectly, um, this is why, this may well be why um, modern Western Christianity has sort of struggled to find a really full on response to the environmental crisis. Um, because it, it's sort of it's wary of nature. It's got this sort of sense we have to somehow manipulate nature um, to get it to conform to our demands. Um, and then the more modern tradition about how uh, we have where we're called to have dominion over nature and things like that. Um, he he argues very much that we need to recover an older tradition actually, um, which uh, doesn't it, it doesn't deny uh, original sin, um, but sees the whole of the cosmos as kind of a need of, of returning to the divine, a kind of spiritualization of the cosmos. Um, and he actually draws a lot more from Orthodox traditions in this as well. So his wife is actually a, a Greek Orthodox. And there, um, it's still very much the case that liturgies speak about the kind of cosmic impact of what they're doing. They're trying to lift and redeem and keep connection and flow with the whole of the natural world, not just with, as it were, individual sinners. Um, so yes. it, it, it's, it's a different tradition, but it's still a very rich tradition, I think. Yes, I mean, the, in the Orthodox tradition, the theology of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the breath of life in all nature, that God is in all nature, immanent, Im, Im, immanent in all nature as the, as the spirit of life, and, which is a very much more attractive theology than St. Augustine's um, fallen thing. So, I mean, that's a major, it's not just resurrecting part of Celtic Christianity that may have been buried for centuries. It's a living tradition in the Orthodox churches. And it's, on the whole, a much more positive view. Um, you know, their general view of humanity is that the purpose of the Christian religion is theosis, making humans into gods. I mean, div divination of, divinization of humanity. And it can't, when I visited Jerusalem several years ago and went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, our group was shown round by the Greek Archbishop of Jerusalem, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Jerusalem, and he made a point that struck me really forcibly on location. You, know, you call it the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we call it the Church of the Resurrection. Oh, right, okay. Anastasia, you know, resurrection. 
that you know here's this event jesus dies and he's resurrected the western church has focused on the death and the tomb and the eastern church on the resurrection so in eastern orthodox churches you see images typically of christ in glory um you know in those mosaic those byzantine mosaics you see very few crucifixes of christ on the cross so it is a rather different take i mean both sides are there but i can see why um the celtic tradition fits perhaps more easily with the orthodox i think it's there it is there in in western tradition too so thomas aquinas you know the high medieval theologian he talks about grace perfecting nature Yes. Um, rather than having to sort of, as it were, redeem its fundamental brokenness. Um, so, and I think so it is there, but what, what, what we have with it, to struggle with is the Reformation, um, and particularly Martin Luther, um, and John Calvin's deep suspicion of, particularly I think, human inner life. Um, and, um, so hence notions like original sin, um, and the distrust of what was going on inside them, you know, very much came to the fore. Um, but perhaps it's, we're now in a period where we can, as it were, reach back back to something, both within our, ourselves, trusting, you know, our inner lives and the felt sense of things, this sense of spiritual connection, um, ourselves and much more, which is something we talk about quite regularly, you know, mm. directly and indirectly, um, but also reaching back more deeply perhaps into the tradition as well for those who, who find inspiration within Christianity. Um, and, of course, there is this... It really matters now because the environmental crisis is so pressing. Um, and whilst no doubt, you know, economic ideas, moral imperatives and so on are going to play a part. I think unless it can also connect to a kind of delight in finding nature once more, um, we're always going to be we are going to feel antagonistic towards uh, the demands that climate change is making on us. But if we can feel that there's real spiritual goods um, that we're being invited to reconnect with as well. You know, then it becomes a different proposition, I think. Um, oh, yeah, I completely agree. Of course, Matthew Fox has done a great deal to um, bring out the positive aspects of nature in, in the Western tradition. In his book, Original Blessing, which is where he first made it so clear, and a lot of his life's work has been on that theme. So there have certainly been people working along these lines. And one of the things about people in the environmental movement, which is often approached in a completely secular spirit, is the high rate of burnout. You know, if it's just a matter of saving the world through ethical imperatives, then there's, there isn't that kind of replenishment of their own spiritual life that can come through a more spiritually based approach. And so I think this is really important. And But the nice thing about it, I'm so glad to hear about him doing these actual practices uh, the, the good thing about it is we can actually do something about it personally and I think the revival of pilgrimage, something we've talked about before, is very much part of this process. I mean if you go on a pilgrimage, um, I went on one just a couple of weeks ago on Exmoor um, and it was just a wonderful experience, a day out in these wild places in the moor um, and ending not as many pilgrimages do it grand sacred place like a cathedral this one ended at Britain's smallest parish church Carlbone which is hidden away in a valley on Exmoor and just a wonderfully peaceful place to end this pilgrimage as our destination um, this sense of connection with the natural world um, through a spiritual process of pilgrimage was really strong for me and I think for most other people on this pilgrimage And so I think that his take on this fits very well does he actually mention pilgrimage in his book yes certainly um you know he i mean he's he's this is a sort of in, individual pursuit in the book that he's talking about and he's interested in the kind of practices um particularly i think associated with the celtic tradition um but nonetheless going to places and the effort of clambering across the rocks or going across the hill setting the intentions that opens you to the different spirit of the place you know the things which are so key in pilgrimage is mm. absolutely there and this sense that just by doing that, paradise, as it were, is just a touch away. Um, it's such a wonderful image. And it's true, the minute you go on a pilgrimage, like you're saying, yes. you, you, you know exactly what that means. Yes. I mean, I have that feeling myself sometimes. You know, even just when I'm going for a walk in the evening on Hampstead Heath or at Kew Gardens, I just feel paradise is so near. 
In fact, I felt that on Exmoor too. Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's a really important point, and I think this is something that for many people would be meaningful. I mean, it's very important to be able to form this spiritual connection with the natural world. So all the help we can get is 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 very welcome. Very much. So um, the book again is The Naked Hermit uh, by Nick Mayhew Smith, um, and it certainly helped me to to imaginatively uh, just get a bit more connected to what. I'm doing when going to these sacred places and, and trying to participate in things. Thanks very much, Rupert. Well, thank you, Mark.